Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, at this time, I call Pastor Rudolph. So much to get to in so little time. Um, I just want to start sequentially, and hopefully I will make coherent sense. Uh, but we heard sort of the accusation from uh, his presentation uh, that Jesus was accursed, and as a result of him being accursed, God is not accursed, and therefore Jesus was not God. But we need to understand in the sort of central theme of Scripture that the very heart of the gospel was that Jesus in his own right laid down his life on our behalf. Let me read to you some words that Jesus speaks. In John 10, verse 18, he says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Um, what does that mean? What does it mean when it speaks of Jesus laying down his life at his own accord? When we look at the Synoptic Gospels, when we look at the Gospel of John, we can see quite clearly and succinctly that when Jesus speaks, Jesus answers quite clearly as to his mission. Jesus comes to ransom us. You see, a temporal man would not have been able to take on the infinity of sins of all mankind. But Jesus says he does. Listen to his mission. Taking, uh, taking the 12 disciples aside, this is in um, uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 32 and 34. Taking the 12 uh, disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him in Jerusalem. When we get to Jerusalem, he told them, The Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachings of the religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, beat him with whips, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. And we can go on and on and on. When we see Jesus specifically speak of his purpose, we can understand that Jesus specifically shows us that as a result of the will of the Father, he submits himself to the will of the Father in that economy of, uh, economy of the Trinity. And what he does, he becomes what? what is known in Christian theology as sort of the vicarious substitution for man. Uh, and you can look at that scripture, and he has mentioned it. That is exactly the point he mentioned, and he called for Isaiah 42. But this is what we see in Isaiah 53. We can see quite clearly that it speaks of him becoming our substitute, and that is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we, we read of that, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But we can see that the intention of the gospel authors is to show us that Jesus became the perfect atonement for our sins, the propitiation for our sins, he brought reconciliation before God for us, and he became the ransom for our redemption, and that is also depicted in Isaiah chapter 53, and also mentioned in Matthew chapter 20. So when we look at the Gospels, we can see quite clearly that Jesus comes and the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament makes it clear that when Jesus comes, he comes and he subjects himself to the Father. Uh, he was made uh, lower than the angels for a little while, the author of Hebrews says. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8, it says that Christ temporarily emptied himself, taking on a form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of man. Uh, again, we need to understand that Scripture speaks quite clearly that Jesus had two natures. Jesus was not denying that he was God. He was merely acknowledging the fact that he was also man. Jesus is both God and man, as we see in Scripture. As a man, he was uh, in, in a lesser position than the Father, then he added, because he added to himself that temporal human nature. We see that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. He became a man to die for people. He had a different mission. So Jesus was not denying at all that he was God. He was simply acknowledging his humanity. So we can see quite clearly when it speaks in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 5, as Jesus coming at the right time, becoming man for us, there was a reason for his incarnation. And that is the point of this discussion tonight. When we look at his messianic ship, when we look at everything that I've, men I've mentioned, his sinlessness, his virgin birth, Jesus being the word of God, Jesus identifying himself as that one which is to come, the son of God. We can see that there's an actual meaning that is deduced in those titles where it refers and it's affirmed over all 66 books of the Bible as to his mission and his purpose. They are succinct. They flow into one another. Was Jesus a man? Well, we can see quite clearly that in Scripture, Christ embodies two radical perspectives, one of transcendent infinitude and, and one of imminent finitude. We call this in Christian theology the hypostatic union. 
This simply means that Jesus has two complete natures, one fully human and one fully divine. What the doctrine of the hypostatic union teaches, though, is that when we look at this one person, we need to understand that Jesus was not two people. He's one person, and in this hypostatic union, he's joining himself uh, uh, to this, uh, in his divine nature to this human one in the person of Jesus Christ. We can see, therefore, quite clearly, as God, Jesus is worshipped. He said, Jesus is nowhere worshipped. Let me shock you and read you a few scriptures. When we look at scriptures specifically, we can see and identify quite clearly that Jesus was worshipped. If I can just get my notes, I can actually tell you where where that is, where I wrote it down. Uh, But when we look at Christ, we can see quite clearly that he's worshipped. The incident with the leper in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, the context shows us quite clearly that he came before Christ. He did not just bow his knee, but he attributes to Christ the very reality of receiving worships. His own disciples... In Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, after his resurrection, it says that they worshipped him, even though some doubted. Uh, Here's another one, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. The author of Hebrews ascribes, and who is speaking in Hebrews chapter 1? God is speaking in Hebrews chapter 1. What is he saying and instructing the angels to do? Worship the Son. We can see that quite clearly depicted in Scripture. And let all the angels of myself, my God, worship him. Uh, we can see that quite clearly. We see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, we can see quite clearly that there's an attribution to Jesus to receive worship. All uh, worship is given to Jesus in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, and we can make and be assured of it according to Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. Every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord at the end of time. So if you worship Jesus now or then, it does not matter. You will see him as who he is. So, did Jesus pray? Yes, Jesus did pray. Uh, Jesus was our perfect example. Jesus speaks in John 13, 15. He says, For I've set to you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Why did Jesus need to pray at all? Jesus prayed audibly for everyone else's benefit so that the people could believe and, and the Bible could be written. It's just an obvious fact. Uh, and no one knows the hour. We heard the scripture being mentioned that no one knows the other, and especially the son does not know the hour. Uh, we hear uh, it being uh, said in, uh, I, th- I can't remember if it was Mark 13 or Matthew 24. I think it was Matthew 24, 34, 35 to 37, that Jesus does not know the, re- the time of his return. Therefore, he is not God. We need to understand Lucutian. When, when Jesus speaks here, he shows a clear distinction between normal men, between angels and himself. But we also need to read the rest of Scripture because when we read something like, for instance, Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1 verse 7, again when the disciples ask him about the time, of restoration, we can see quite clearly that Jesus speaks emphatically that no one is supposed to know the time or the hour except the Father. Jesus speaks of a distinct function of the Father. Jesus is saying to his disciples, no, I'm not concerning myself with the time or the hour. That is given by God's authority. He's going to do that. I concern myself with my mission right now. But interestingly enough, we also need to understand when we look at the passage of Scripture where he denounces him knowing the hour or the day, we need to read it in its context. In Mark chapter 13, verse 31, we can also see that Jesus affirms the eternality of his word. So we like to move to verse 32, and we like to say, Jesus does not know the hour. But in a verse just before it, Jesus speaks, and he shows quite clearly that whatever he says is eternally preserved. So we need to understand that when Jesus speaks, Jesus speaks authoritatively of himself, giving legitimacy to the word of God because he was God. We heard the fig tree argument. Now, this I will go through very quickly. But when we look at Jesus cursing the fig tree, he's obviously in a proleptic way showing quite emphatically that he's cursing and distinctively uh, uh, elevating this tree and he's showing in this narrative to his disciples that Israel, like the fig tree, is cursed and therefore will wither up from the root. But interestingly enough, we can see there's another incident of the fig tree being cursed. By Yahweh in Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 13. So when we read this narrative, we understand that the gospel author is showing us that Yahweh is doing his works. He's cursing the fig tree and he's uprooting it. And Jesus does the same thing. What is Jesus trying to say? Jesus is showing us that in his authority as God, he's cursing the fig tree as Yahweh. 
We heard Numbers 23 verse 19 being mentioned. And let me just read it to you in its context. Because sometimes people quote, and they only quote part of it. We hear it being mentioned and being said that God is not a man, that he should lie. You see, therefore God is not a man. Let me read to you the full sort of verse. It says the following. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a human being that he should change his mind. Has he said and did it not happen? Or has he spoken and will it not happen? This verse specifically does not mean anything or speak emphatically about God's anatomy of his being. It speaks about the surety of God's decree. So we need to be fair when we read these scriptures, and we need to see quite clearly that when the scriptures speak, it speaks quite clearly about the surety of God's word, not the anatomy of his nature. Uh, we heard the parable being mentioned that, that uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 uh, had a power that, that got extracted from him when the woman touched the hem of his garment. Isn't it interesting that in the very same chapter, in chapter 9 verse 2, uh, we, we always need to read, and I always say this, and my Bible school students will know this. Text without context is pretext. We cannot take one verse and build a doctrine on it. It is just not fair in the Quran and with the Quran and with the Christian scriptures. But when we look at this uh, narrative being told in Matthew chapter 9, Matthew speaks to us, and what does he speak of in verse 2 of chapter 9, before he speaks of the lady touching the hem of the garment? Jesus goes and he heals the leper. And then when he heals the leper, what does he say to the leper? Son, your sins are forgiven. Now let me just say this. In Isaiah 43, 25, Acts 8 verse 22, in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 39, only God forgives sins. In fact, in Surah 3 verse 135, it stipulates quite clearly that only God forgives sin. So if it's only God that forgives sin, who is Jesus? Hold on. Not there yet. Only God forgives sin. And therefore we need to be pretty clear when we speak of this. We heard uh, it being mentioned that in the Quran... Jesus creates from clay birds, and he creates these clay birds as a miracle, uh, as a sign. Let me just suggest to you that we do find that narrative quite clearly in another source. We do not find it in the Christian's orthodox sources. We do not find it in the earliest gospels, yes, but we do find it somewhere else. And we find it in ancient Gnostic texts that are farly removed from the actual four gospels. We need to ask ourselves, though, very honestly... Why do we find Gnostic source material in the Quran? I'm being very honest. I'm not being facetious. We're not facetious. We're still friends. Okay? But we need to ask these things. And we can look at, uh, and we can actually go through the Quran. We can understand and we can see quite clearly that when we look at the constructs that have been made, we can see quite clearly that whenever the Quran speaks in a specific context, when it relates to Jesus, it does not relate to the Jesus of the Bible. That is the whole point. When I speak about the titles of Christ like Son of God, Messiah, and the Word, it does not measure up to what is established and laid down in the Old and New Testament. The Scripture shows us that Jesus in His infinitude became a man. When we look at the intention of, of what John is depicting, John is describing a reality, and in verse 18... What does it say? It says, the only begotten Son, He revealed the Father. In actual fact, some of our texts, uh, some of the earliest texts, describe that and says that Jesus was the monogamous theos. He was the only beloved from God that revealed God. Verse 1 already established quite clearly who Jesus was. He was, he was God. And then in John 20, verse 28, we can see quite emphatically and clearly as well that Thomas, when he comes to the realization and understanding of who Jesus was, what was his words? Oh, my Lord and my God. Now, that was not like being amazed, saying, oh, my Lord, oh, my God. No, it says he directly said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Let me end off with this. When we take all of what has been said, we need to evaluate it fairly when we read the Quran and the Christian scriptures. And that is the contention tonight. Tonight when we read both texts, we need to be fair and interpret it in such a way. I thank you.